Three Incarnations of the Evil Dead. The first of these films is a 30 minute short, acting as a proof of concept for a higher budget feature. The second is a cult classic, and probably the most famous of the notorious video nasties, launching the careers of its director and star. The third is a reimagining that adopted a more serious tone, revered for its brutal and frequent skin crawling violence. But which is the best? Throughout the 1970s, a teenage Sam Raimi churned out a series of comedies that appealed to his goofy sensibilities. They often featured ridiculous titles like The Great Bogus Monkey Pignut Swindle. His ambition was plain to see, especially when he created a feature-length film, It's Murder, while still in college. Like the short films that preceded it, It's Murder was a team effort involving Raimi's usual collaborators such as his brother Ted and his friends, most notable among them being Bruce Campbell. Raimi never had much to say about the film, but he did praise one scene in particular. The moment in question was based on suspense, not comedy. Something clicked in the minds of Sam and Bruce. Neither were huge horror fans at the time, but the move towards the genre seemed a no-brainer, especially for filmmakers looking to produce on the cheap. They quickly soaked up every B-movie and drive-in showing they could, developing a kind of cinematic bloodlust in the process. The gore, the merrier, stated Raimi, adopting it as a motto. His first foray into the genre was the short film Clockwork, a stalker slasher type movie. But someone like him was never going to stop at one attempt. Using Clockwork as a learning opportunity and finding inspiration from Lovecraft, Raimi and Campbell devised an ambitious story involving friends in the woods, demonic possession, and a Necronomicon-style Book of the Dead. Sounds great? Well, reality's a bitch. Such a project would require a much higher budget than they had ever worked with before, never mind the logistics of actually acquiring the cash. Sam Raimi concocted the genius idea to produce a prototype a smaller scale version of the story that could be shopped to potential investors to fund the real deal. And so, the 1978 short film Within the Woods came into existence. In order to fit into a slimmer runtime, the plot was reduced to its simplest form. A group of friends venture to a cottage in the woods for a little break. One couple endures some all too relatable Monopoly based arguments, while the other couple goes for a nice evening stroll. This is Bruce Campbell and Ellen Sandweiss, playing characters called Bruce and Ellen. Bruce warns her that they are in fact treading all over a Native American burial ground. Yeah, that old crux. There was a period of time in the late 70s and early 80s where you couldn't move for ancient fucking Native American burial grounds. Oh, you wanna buy a new house? Well, this one looks good. Oh fuck, never mind, it's on a Native American burial ground. Oh, what about this one? It's got a nice annex, a little conservatory even. Plenty of floor space. Oh fuck, it's on a Native American burial ground. <laughs> Despite his own concerns, Bruce succumbs to his undying love of hot dogs. Hot dogs. Hot dogs. And starts digging for firewood. This upsets the natives. Interestingly enough, considering Bruce would become the face of the series for the next 45 years, he kicks the bucket early on. Ellen becomes the central protagonist, echoing the final girl trope that was certainly prevalent at the time. The remainder of the short film sees Ellen battling a possessed Bruce as she tries to survive the night. Within the Woods is a fun watch from a fan's perspective. A fair amount of content that would eventually transition over to the Evil Dead is already in place here. There's the floating POV from the unseen entity and the incessant chanting of join us. Don't forget the old trap the hand in the door and stab it trick. Or how about Ellen being unable to unlock the door before getting jump scared by a friendly arm and saved at the last second. Someone trips on the way down to the basement. A possessed villain removes their own hand. A passionate axe attack defeats a baddie. And most importantly, there's a really fucking passive aggressive swing chair. Surviving copies of the short film are in less than ideal condition, but frankly, 
that adds an appropriately cursed vibe. I feel like if I don't pass this film on in seven days, I'll be raped by a twig. But even through the VHS glitches and audio tracks regularly warping into digital brown noise, the quality shines through. As a very low budget short film from the late 70s, it will be a chore for a normal viewer. For fans of Raimi and Evil Dead, it is a delightful curiosity. It obviously lacks the polish of the later movies, but the promise of the team's talent is evident. Bruce's charm already bursts through the screen. That's probably why the copies are in such bad shape, the tapes couldn't handle that much natural swagger. And nobody can say he did not suffer for his craft. Tom Sullivan's makeup work was too difficult to apply and remove on their schedule and budget. With the shoot running over both days and nights, Bruce just went to sleep with the makeup on. When he finally removed it, he was terrified to find it had actually transformed the shape of his face. Fear not, to the relief of chin enthusiasts everywhere, his face returned to normal after some time. Pardon you. Their comedy backgrounds briefly creep in, whether it was intentional or not. Ellen accidentally stabs the other fellow, thinking it was the possessed Bruce. To make matters worse, to try and save them both, she starts slamming the poor dude with the door. And after all is said and done, she falls down too hard and pushes on the wound she inflicted in the first place. <laughs> it's never really scary. The makeup and violence are understandably relatively subdued, and it lacks key iconography we associate with the series, such as Chainsaws and The Book of the Dead. None of these are serious problems though, they're mostly criticisms based in hindsight. Within the Woods, however, remains a fine example of good friends working together against the odds to achieve a creative goal. $1,600 later, Sam Raimi had his completed short. The team wanted to enter the big leagues with this project, but had no idea on how to distribute the damn thing. The first step was having the 8mm footage blown up to 35mm, the industry standard. That decision may have saved them money on the film stock, but resulted in a grainy, sometimes messy picture quality after the conversion. Finding investors was a long and arduous process, but their luck changed thanks to a fringe theatre in Detroit. Who saw that come in? The cinema's manager agreed to show Within the Woods as a double feature with the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The attendees of the midnight screening proved to be the weird target audience that the film needed. So word slowly began to spread, as did some money. Raimi never quite met his financial goals for the planned feature remake of Within the Woods. Instead of the intended $150,000, he only acquired $90,000. Time and time again, the filmmaker proved he would be undeterred by setbacks, and went off to make the bloody movie anyway. Armed with a larger budget, and far more resources than they'd ever previously had at their fingertips, Raimi, Campbell, and producer Robert Tappert could finally bring their full nasty vision to life. 1981's The Evil Dead still follows a group of young friends on holiday in the woods, but every aspect of the short film is expanded upon tenfold. I don't recommend watching both films back to back, you'll give yourself whiplash. The improvements are night and day. Right from the opening demonic POV, you realise Raimi and co are operating in a whole other ballpark now. The effect is a lot smoother, creepier, unnatural, more intense. In reality, it's either Campbell pushing Raimi around in a dinghy, or the two of them running a wood-mounted camera through the trees. But on the screen, it works perfectly, and remains one of the first things I think of when recalling the movie. The friendship group is raised from four to five. I would say the more the merrier, but then again, remember Raimi's twist on that saying? To him, more friends in the group means a higher body count. How exciting. Bruce and Ellen have returned now as siblings instead of a couple. They arrive at the haunted cabin in a shot that preempts modern video gaming, and come face to face with that horrible fucking bench again. That wooden prick is the biggest baddest omen in history. Indeed, bad things are afoot. Fortunately, they did away with the whole Native American burial ground bullshit, 
and introduced the Necronomicon, as they had originally intended with the short. Flesh-bound books, Texas Chainsaw-style decorations, a cellar door with a serious case of Telltale Heart Syndrome, and an expositional recording that perfectly skirts the line between scary and campy. Bad things afoot, indeed. A third of the way through, things get wild. The simple story, small cast, and single location lay a solid foundation for Raimi to just literally chuck everything at the wall to see which slimy bits stick. We get everything you could possibly ask for in a movie. Possessions, stabbing, slicing, gnawing, bushwhacking, gouging, decapitations, blood bukkakes, monobrows, illegal use of pencils, one-two punches from a shelf, inconveniently placed tins, obvious dull stand-ins, melting play-doh, and a roof with musical beams. The Evil Dead is just an absolutely exhilarating experience. It's not as madcap as Evil Dead 2, but it still packs a pretty fucking hard punch, especially given the circumstances. The shooting schedules were overrun, and money frequently ran out. The gang had to go door to door for additional funds. Bruce put his house up as collateral, just to help the film over the line for Christ's sake. Production shut down for a year, and returned without much of the supporting cast. So, continuity was fucked to Gettysburg, and stand-ins were required all over the place, but you barely notice, as you're being blinded with blood. The majority of the crew lived in the cabin itself for the duration of the shoot. Cramped, frustrated, freezing their willies off, unable to take showers due to a lack of plumbing. Just imagine the smell of sweat mixing with all that syrup and cream from the fake blood. That gooey concoction was used so frequently that it actually dried stiff on Bruce's shirt and cracked apart. Real injuries occurred too. Teeth were lost when cameras came too close, and actors were scratched by raging deadite operators. In other words, the backstory is equally as mental as the on-screen carnage. That is the underlying charm of The Evil Dead for me. I do prefer the sequel, but the 1981 original has a special certain something. It manages to somehow feel like a mainstream horror film, while retaining the sense of a group of friends experimenting creatively in the woods. It's amateurish, but it's the best amateurs you've ever seen. It's no wonder that the film was an inspiration to so many wannabe filmmakers back then, and still to this day. The game plan of funding The Evil Dead via the short film directly inspired the Coen brothers to do the same with Blood Simple, after Joel Coen partially edited The Evil Dead. So, if you've been influenced by Raimi and The Evil Dead, that alone puts you in damn good company. Sam Raimi is best known for his frenzied creative camera work. It's always interesting then to return to this film and see how this very early movie is already so obviously his work. The auteur theory is alive and well inside this crazy motherfucker. The POV shots often get all the love, but there is never a shortage of curious cinematography here. The over-the-top violence gets people's pulses racing, but it's the direction that really elevates the material. We've all sadly seen what Cabin in the Woods horror films look like in the hands of boring or lazy filmmakers. Meanwhile, Sam Raimi's throwing out demented shit like 360 degree pans and enough Dutch angles to legally class the film as a co-production with Holland. The Evil Dead was guided through post-production via industry veteran Irvin Shapiro, whose previous distribution work ranged right back to the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Jesus. The film then received a major push after Stephen King drowned the film in praise. It became immensely popular and an instant cult classic becoming a smash hit in the VHS rentals charts. Over here in the UK, it famously became one of the first to be labelled a video nasty. I mean, it's easy to see why. It suffered cuts and bans all over the world, but thankfully, we now live in an age where we can easily access the full film in all its crimson glory. After Army of Darkness, the Evil Dead series entered into a state of limbo. No further films were coming out, but the franchise branched out into other mediums. A handful of video games 
comic books, and even a musical kept the brand alive on a smaller scale, while the gang figured out where the cinematic story should go. For years there were rumblings of a fourth Evil Dead starring Bruce Campbell, but the repeated rumours always died as quickly as they had arrived. Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema had the groovy idea of Ash vs Freddy vs Jason, but Raimi and friends shot it down with every boomstick they could muster. It turned out they were more interested in a potential remake. They would maintain control as producers, but offered a director's chair to any upcoming horror talent who tickled their fancy. Makes sense, considering Raimi was busy spending quality pizza time with Tobey Maguire. Pizza time. Speculation rose from the depths with demonic force. Most famously, word on the street was that Ashton Kutcher would don the chainsaw hand. Well, his name is already Ash, so that would eliminate any possible confusion on set, I guess. Reception to this notion was... unfriendly, shall we say? Check out message boards from that era, if you want a quick giggle. It is not confirmed, but is on IMDb movie page for this flick. Oh my god, what a fuck barbecue! Fuck this shit. Fucking hell. Bruce Campbell or bust. The fucking punked guy? Bullshit. Mason am cry. If this is true, I will find you and hit you with my car. Please god, no! Dude, where's my 1973 Oldsmobile Delta 88? Even if this was just a fan rumour all along, the backlash made it abundantly clear that creating a straight remake was a no-go for fans. Ash was Bruce, Bruce was Ash. So, in a move that can be considered incredibly S-smart, they opted to craft a remake slash soft reboot slash technically fourth movie in the series, but it would not feature Ash. Instead, a new cast of characters with their own fresh backstories and identities would be haunted in that damn cabin. The hot new talent to helm the film wound up being a relative unknown from Uruguay. Feder Alvarez had directed four short films throughout the 2000s, the last of these was Attack de Panico, aka Panic Attack. In 2009, he uploaded the sci-fi action short to YouTube, and it went viral instantly. Alvarez remarked that he uploaded it on Thursday, and by Monday, his inbox was flooded with messages from Hollywood. Living the dream, eh, you bastard? It was soon announced that Alvarez had been given a $30 million deal from Ghost House Pictures to develop and direct a feature length film. That project ended up being the long gestating Evil Dead reboot, which he co wrote from the ground up, with the intention of taking the series back to its horror roots. The opening scene certainly establishes that tone pretty firmly. A young girl is stalked through the misty woods, before it's revealed she's a demon. She is promptly burned alive and shot by her father, Hillbilly Dylan Moran. Shit. You realise this film has taken it darker and more serious than the franchise ever was to begin with. The 1981 film might be comedically subdued compared to Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness, but it still contains its fair share of levity. Don't let the noise fool you girls, this thing is solid as a rock. <laughs> hey. There is little room for frolics and ironic one-liners here. There is room for a new bunch of friends. Olivia the nurse, Natalie the new girlfriend, Eric, the guy who didn't get the memo that this wasn't a period piece, and also David and Mia. They are siblings with a troubled past, involving an even more troubled mother. We learn they're here to help Mia kick her heroin habit in a safe, <laughs> controlled, <laughs> environment. Maybe things will be okay this time. Look, the swinging harbinger of doom has finally chilled the fuck out. Uh, I spoke too soon. Eric finds the Book of the Dead and gains a paper cut. The Necronomicon strikes again! The situation spirals out of whack at a swifter pace than the original. The first act hinges around a real bad sniff. I don't know what they're fussing about, it's probably just a leftover smell from the 1981 crew. Or not, it's revealed to be a basement full of dead cats. Grim, but that's just the beginning. Mia is a yummy target for the soul-munching demons, but the group just thinks she's not enjoying her plate of cold turkey. She scarpers, but is thwarted hastily. Weird place to meet your doppelganger. Ah, fancy meeting myself here. Wait, I think you need to reconsider your diet. Mia is possessed and attacks the others, triggering a new wave of bloody batshit madness. 
Evil Dead 2013 basically becomes a feature length safety awareness video on how not to use your household items. Careful with that bread slicer, nail gun, pliers, crowbar, shower, syringe, hammer, chainsaw, toilet, and for god's sake don't lick the knife. This is brutal stuff and makes the original look like a campy cartoon. It's dark, dirty, it's grimy. The 80s film was extreme for the era. It was only fitting that the 2013 film should be the equivalent for the 2010s. That age of horror seemed to favour the slow burn types, your Babadooks and whatnot. Evil Dead stood out like a very, very sore thumb in the best possible way. The finale is masterful, a set piece unashamed to go balls to the wall. Mia goes from fighting her metaphorical demons to her literal demon as the film turns into a music video for Slayer's Raining Blood. 70,000 gallons of blood was reportedly used in the film, with 50,000 of the icky stuff used for this sequence alone. Bela Lugosi's wet dream. Alvarez manages to capture the essence of Raimi without feeling like an imitation. The only element that comes close is the POV demon shots. They put me off at first. It didn't feel right, not coming from Raimi. But think about it, it wouldn't be Evil Dead without it, and to their credit, it's used very sparingly. No, Alvarez did a very impressive job. I guess this series just brings out the best in directors, making their jump to the big leagues. The characters are more fleshed out, no pun intended. There's more effort to give them motivation and backstory, as opposed to just some unlucky kids on a holiday. This works brilliantly, as the script doubles down on the taunting from the villains. Mia's addiction issues and David's extreme familial guilt are toyed with to great effect. Their granddad is also transformed into a dog. That's nice too. Grandpa? Keen-eyed viewers will spot plenty of references to the original. The necklace and its uncanny ability to form a skull shape, the 1981 film's poster, the original car, and so on. It's a really surprisingly good film. I hate the idea of an Evil Dead remake on paper. Haunted blowfish am cry. I didn't think it would ever work, but I've never been more glad to be wrong. The film continues to hold up on rewatches too. The savagery remains just as savage, and the end still leaves you fist pumping the air. It succeeded at the box office, earning $97 million off a budget of $17 million. Nice. Evil Dead was officially back. Hail to the king, baby. Spurred on by the reaction to the post-credit cameo, Ash returned with his own TV show a couple of years later. Almost exactly 10 years on, a new film, Evil Dead Rise, is currently riding a very large hype train. The franchise owes its second win solely to the little reboot that could. It just goes to show, sometimes even the sacred horror films might benefit from a refurnishing here and there. Now then, shall we move on to the hard part? Yes, let's have some verdicts. Best While the remake's baddies are gross and efficient in what they do, I lean to the original with this one. Give me those crazy pasty looking freaks any day. Best protagonist, best protagonist, best protagonist, best protagonist, best protagonist, best protagonist, Ash or Mia. I might receive some pushback for this, but I think for now, I'd go with Mia. In the 1981 film, Ash isn't quite the Ash we've grown to know and love. Mia's story of recovery is well established. She goes through the ringer, and her eventual victory is cathartic as hell. Thank God Raimi persuaded Alvarez to change the original ending, where Mia would perish too. Best, 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 so much choice. Both films are loaded with memorable executions. In the end, I have to go with The End. Mia vs Mia. As I said, cathartic as hell. Best, best, film, best, best, film, best, film, best, best, film, best, film, best, film. This might be the hardest best film category I've encountered in this Originals vs Remakes series so far. Within the Woods is not a contender, we can all agree on that, but the other two are pillars of their eras. The Evil Dead is held on a pedestal, with good reason, while the remake is technically superior. Ugh. Can I declare a draw? 
This is one of those choices that changes day by day. Today, I'm going to choose the remake. But ask me again tomorrow and I'll choose the original. How do you feel about these Evil Dead movies? Is the decision of best film as tough for you as it is for me? Let us know in the comments below. Stay evil and stay deadly, friends of the Blowfish.